Hi everyone, my name is Matt Williams. I'm the Access Fellow at Jesus College at the University of Oxford. I'm going to talk through 12 past interview questions for law this morning. Now, I have experience of over 10 years of working in admissions at Oxford University as a tutor. I'm also what's known as the Access Fellow, meaning that I'm responsible for making the college and the university more accessible, especially to people who've historically been underrepresented at Oxford. So I'm going to talk through some past interview questions for law to give you my top tips about how to perform to your best. I'm going to be going through an acronym, which I think should be quite useful. The acronym is PACE, and that stands for Precision, Analysis, Creativity and Energy. Those are some of the criteria that you can utilise not only to perform well in an interview, but to perform superlatively and to really stand out from the crowd. And I'll be going through each of those four ideas step by step and giving some example questions just to help you understand the sort of questions that we're likely to ask. Okay, PACE is also a useful acronym because it broadly speaking def describes one of the most useful tools that you can utilize in any interview, which is to relatively speaking, slow down the pace of your thinking. When you slow down the pace of your thinking, you're more likely to engage your frontal cortex, more likely to engage the thinking components of your brain. In other words, you're not just going to be regurgitating knowledge and facts, you're gonna be really engaging with the question precisely in a focused way, and you're much more likely to come up with a solution that is unique and your own, as opposed to something that is derivative of somebody else's thought processes. Okay, now I should note that I'm half blind, so I'm gonna be wearing these glasses. It does look a little bit like I'm wearing sunglasses indoors, but don't worry, I haven't adopted that much of an Oxford affectation, I promise. Anyway, so let's get started. Okay, so first of all, precision. Now, lawyers in particular are interested in precise uses of language. And when certain words are used, they will pick up on those words and they'll ask about them and how they could be interpreted in multiple different ways. I mean, to put it crudely, I would say that lawyers trade in language. That's how they add value to an economy. And so if a law tutor is asking you a question, they expect you to have a degree of attention to detail of the language used in that question. So one common mistake that interviewees adopt is that they start drifting ever so slightly away from the question wording. You need to retain the question precisely in your mind. And the particular language used in that question is going to be relevant for how you frame your response. And if you want to make it absolutely clear to the interviewer that you are responding in a focused and relevant way, then a good tip is to repeat the question back to them when framing your answer. So here's a few examples just to show you what I'm talking about. So the first question is, if the punishment for parking on double yellow lines were death, now uh, for those outside the UK, parking on double yellow lines is illegal parking. Okay? If the punishment for parking on double yellow lines were death and therefore nobody did it, would that be a just and effective law? Okay? Now the interviewers are going to be looking for someone who can focus on those core concepts of just and effective. And they're not going to be terribly happy if you start introducing synonyms. So instead of say just, you start talking about fair. Now fairness and justice you could argue are broadly synonymous, but it's not the same concept and a lawyer is quite particular with language. So they're gonna want you to focus on what it means to be just before you start talking about what it means to be fair. Okay, so when you're framing a response, you might want to say something like, yes, it would be just and effective because, and then ex explain yourself. When you're explaining yourself, you can then start saying it would be just because it would be fair. I mean, it's hard to see how it could be fair, but anyway, you know, you might sort of think that executing people for illegal parking might be fair, but you know, I'll leave that to you. Okay, the point is that you need to use the question wording in framing your response, because if you're not using the question wording, then you're not being relevant, you're not being precise, and lawyers are very precise people. So the interview will start with discussing the nature of illegal parking and whether or not it might be just and effective uh, for a law to have a capital punishment attached to it if someone parks illegally, okay? And so really we're gonna be starting to get into the weeds of what it means for anything, any law to be just and effective, because that, I, I would uh, suggest is the ultimate point of this question. It's not particularly interested in parking per se, but in the justice and effectiveness of laws. The point at which parking can become relevant is of course because parking is itself an ambiguous terminology. And so this is another aspect of precision. If you're the sort of person that has an eye for detail, you'll notice that the question hinges not only on what it means for a law to be just and effective, but also what it means to park, right? What's the difference between parking your car and stopping your car? Is it something to do with stopping with intent? Uh, you, know, you know, what if you pull over 
uh, because you've swallowed a fly and you're coughing a lot and you want to just dislodge it. Is that parking? How long do you have to have stopped for before it lapses from mere stopping into outrageous parking? Okay, you know, a good lawyer, if they were defending a client, would have to really uh, take to task the notion of parking in order to prevent their client from being executed <laughs> for parking on a double yellow line. Okay, now also think of other details of language here. It's, it's asking you whether it would be just and effective. Now the temptation could be that to suggest that it may be effective, in other words you may stop illegal parking if you make it a capital offence, but it would be unjust because it's such a grossly disproportionate punishment given the offence. But of course it could be both or neither at the same time, so try and think about how the conjunction and even operates. That's the sort of precision that we we might like to look for in prospective law students. Not only the core sort of obvious uh, important pillars of this question of just and effective, but also parking and even and, right? Because one proposition might be that because the law is so unjust, it would be ineffective. In other words, you couldn't possibly enforce such an unjust law, that the citizens would rise up in bloody revolution, surely, if any government attempted to execute illegal parkers, if they had the capacity to do so. So that's one way to think about sort of adding some complexity to this. Okay, good. Um, so the second question is, does a Girl Scout have a political agenda? Now, please bear in mind that interviews for law don't necessarily assume any foreknowledge, and they certainly don't assume that you know a lot about the Girl Scout movement, okay? So this is a question about how you would define a political agenda. So again, a precise use of language is important. What does it mean to have an agenda of any description? It's a good idea to start with the noun and then think about the qualifier. So the noun being agenda, the qualifying adjective being political. So what does any agenda look like? So it's someone who has some sort of scheme, some sort of plan or program of action that they, they wish to implement. And that might be political insofar as it pertains to power, power relations, okay? So a political agenda, we could argue, is, is along those lines, okay? So why might it be said that a Girl Scout has a political agenda? Well, the Scout movement was originally intended for boys. Now, you don't necessarily need to know that. The interviewers will give you that information if it's required. So don't worry if you're not familiar with the Girl Scouts. Uh, the, the notion is that it may have originally been for boys and therefore a Girl Scout might be argued to have a political agenda insofar as by adopting these, uh, this, uh, um, this group, this organization that was originally for boys, that it might have a political connotation to it. Now, this is a, this is a very uh, provocative question, deliberately provocative. I mean, it's fairly uh, counterintuitive to suggest that a Girl Scout would have a political agenda because that just seems mad even to suggest it. Um, but what the interviewers are really interested in is to get a sense of the rich possibilities of language like political agenda, what it could possibly mean. So there's no accusation here. This is not sort of saying, what, what on earth are girls doing in the scouting movement? You know, we're not, we're not misogynists in Oxford, I promise. So it's more just to get into the weeds of the language because that's what we like, precise use of language. Okay, so when someone asks you a question, for goodness sake, pick up on those little details because that's what they're looking for. And when you're framing your response, does a Girl Scout have a political agenda? Yes, no, she does or does not have a political agenda. You must utilize that language before you go on to define it clearly. Okay, uh, so the final question with regard to precision, is wearing a school uniform a breach of human rights? So again, human rights is an interesting concept here. Um, a breach, is, a, is an interesting idea as well. Uh, breach is almost metaphorical use of language here. You know, we, we imagine breaching in, in other sort of contexts. Uh, so that notion of sort of a breach of human rights is interesting. Um, so there are lots of interesting sort of parts of speech in this question that you may be encouraged to pick up on, okay? So have a clear sighted think about the language used and make sure that you integrate it into the formulation of your answer. So is wearing school uniform a breach of human rights? Absolutely it is. Yes, wearing school uniform is a breach of human rights would be, for example, a very focused, precise answer from which, of course, you can elaborate and add sophistication and nuance. You can define various terms such as uniformity, such as human rights, but you've got to start with a clear and precise basis from which to build. Okay, so that's P. So remember the acronym we're working towards is PACE and the first P is precision. And the A is analysis. So once we've started with a clear 
focused beginning to an interview, we're then going to see how deep into the puzzle you're able to go. Okay, and this is to do with analysis. Now, analysis is a little bit like deconstructing a cake. So imagine you've got a beautiful cake in front of you and you are going to set about deconstructing it. So you're going to try and basically put it back into its original ingredients. Now, obviously, that's not chemically possible, but let's just sort of, for the sake of argument, imagine you're able to take the icing sugar, the water, the milk, the eggs, the flour, the colouring, whatever else, right? So you're, you're able to then go from a cake into all of the individual ingredients. So you know precisely what went into producing that cake. Analysis is similar. You've got a very complicated, multifaceted phenomenon problem, and you're going to deconstruct it into its different parts and see what's laying out on the table in front of you, metaphorically speaking. And from that observation of the components of a puzzle, you can start to understand it better, perhaps. Right? Once you know what's inside a cake, you can maybe understand what's causing you to feel bloated after eating it. <laughs> okay? Just as if you've got a really complicated multifaceted problem, if you know all of the potential elements it contains, you may understand it better and you may be able to resolve it better. Okay? So here are a few examples just to sort of give you a bit of a clearer sense of what I'm talking about. So the first question is, can you define intellectual property? Okay. So again, precision with language, as we were discussing in the previous slide, what is property? In this case, it's the noun. Uh, qualified by the adjective intellectual. So we're asking you about intellectual property and what you think that is. So a fairly uh, strong start would be to discuss elements of what it might mean to have property that is of the mind. So maybe a piece of writing, a piece of music, that is something that was a product of your original genius that you want to have recognized as rightfully your own and that someone else can't just steal it from you, just as with any physical property. Okay, now analysis is where you really sort of get into the depth, the crevices of this puzzle. And this again can hinge on your fine tuned attention to details. Can you define? Now, to define something is to make it finite. That's a sort of literal transliteration of that. So, can you make some intellectual property into something finite where there is a sort of a clear square box around the concept? Well, arguably, you can't. So this is the sort of intent. We're reading the, the, the sense of can in terms of the potential. Can it be done? You could argue completely grammatically accurately, you cannot define intellectual property, not because you may not want to, but because it can't actually be done. Because if you start to sort of draw a neat box around the notions of intellectual property, you could start creating all sorts of other downstream problems for the legal system. Now, hopefully you can see that by looking very carefully about at uh, the verb define and how it, it, how it works with can, we're coming up with a more nuanced and sophisticated analysis of what intellectual property is than may be possible if we just start with stuff that we know. Now, this is the huge and important point about uh, interviews is that most candidates at Oxford, they are desperate to share how much stuff they know. So they might start talking about a court case they've heard about with regard to intellectual property. They might tell us about the Disney Corporation's attitudes to intellectual property. They're just sort of fact, 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 all over the place, exploding like bombs. What the interviewers really want is to sh you to show off your thinking skills, not show off how much stuff you know, because knowing stuff is not in the grand scheme, terribly impressive. Thinking through puzzles, that's what we make most of our admissions decisions on. So someone who can say, well, let's have a think about what property is and how it's been qualified by the adjective intellectual, and let's think about the verb define, and can we be definite about intellectual property, and can you define it? We've first of all thought about the potential to define it. Well, what about the volitional form? Would you want to define intellectual property? Can you do it? Is it within your, your will to define intellectual property? Because maybe it's a, a gross injustice to start defining the products of the mind because it could be an outrageous claim that any individual could be so genius as to have produced something completely on their own. I mean, even Shakespeare didn't work alone. So even someone who claims to be an absolute sort of a fount of, of genius is very unlikely to actually be the sole creator of everything that they produce. They would have had influences. They would have had collaborators. So the notion that you can you can define intellectual property could be a monstrous injustice to to the state of reality. So hopefully you can see that by picking apart 
the various parts of this question, we're really stretching the range of possibilities of, of, of uh, analysis. Now, ultimately, you're still expected to try and answer these questions. So, you know, you could spend the whole interview just saying, oh, what does can mean? What does define mean? <laughs> you know, really sort of picking it apart. What you're ultimately trying to do is resolve this puzzle. So you might, for example, want to just, you know, throw a pin in the board and say, I'm going to say, no, you can't define intellectual property. And then you can go through it in that sort of detail and basically form a defense. And, you know, lawyers are very used to doing that. They're, they're used, to be used to being handed a brief and being told, basically, you've got to find a defense for this client. So you don't necessarily need to come into it knowing whether you're going to answer yes, no, or, or some sort of complex maybe response. You can potentially work backwards. Anyway, um, should we have laws for the use of light bulbs is the second question. Should we have laws for the use of light bulbs? Right, so again, depth of analysis, thinking about where light bulbs might be. Uh, so light bulbs are in a whole range of different uh, items. Uh, is a light bulb different from an LED, a light emitting diode? Arguably yes, so you might sort of want to ask about whether or not the light bulb is being distinguished from other light emitting products. Uh, you know, uh, such as your phone, your mobile phone emits light, but it doesn't have light bulbs in it in this sort of the old fashioned sense. Okay. So again, we're by, by clear sighted and careful analysis of the question, we're already adding some value. We're adding some insights into what could be said about this puzzle. Um, should we have laws for the use of light bulbs? Well, there are some laws already about the use of light bulbs. I couldn't, for example, use a light bulb as a murder weapon, <laughs> right? Because you can't use anything as a murder weapon, right? So there are various uh, things uh, about the use of light bulbs that, you know, that, that are regulated, albeit not explicitly in law. Um, and then we're sort of thinking about should. Well, what does should mean? Well, should could have a sort of... Uh, could have a range of different interpretations. And this is where you can really sort of think that you're breaking down the cake of this puzzle into lots of different potential ingredients. You know, we could talk about should in a sense of sort of mitigation of climate change. Should we regulate or the use of light bulbs? Should we have laws against it? Because, uh, because they may be a terribly inefficient way of illuminating our homes, for example. Uh, should we have laws for the use of it because they can create various other forms of pollution, light pollution in urban environments, for example? Uh, should we have laws for the use of light bulbs to mandate the use of light bulbs because it could be that it, it reduces and attenuates crime in certain parts of the community? So, you know, there are various ways you can skin this particular cat. And that's the point of analysis is that you're able to see all of those possible ways before launching into a particular path. Now the interviewers will help you with this analysis. They're not going to sort of sit back, fold their arms and just wait for you to try and come up with all of this insight on your own. They will help you through it just as they would in a tutorial discussion at Oxford. Um, but you can start to preemptively go through some of these processes and it, it, it comes with practice. It's simply a matter of practice. This is not a product of natural born genius. This is just the ability to take a puzzle and just to look at it systematically and to slow down the way you think to slower the pace of your thinking so that you engage your brain more and you're not relying on knowledge so much you're relying on thought okay finally what does it mean for someone to take another's car right now here the interviewers have quite deliberately sort of highlighted part of the question they want you to focus on which is the the concept of taking something okay um and so you need to have a really sort of multi-dimensional look at what it means to take something away you know what for example would happen if um, you were to just jump in someone's car for a second. Uh, have you taken it in that second? Uh, you know, maybe they're still in the car. <laughs> maybe you're, you're sort of a lunatic and you just sort of climb into someone's car while they're in a car park and they're sort of unpacking. Have you taken their car? Um, I mean, it, it may be that there are some sort of pretty clear cut cases where someone steals a car and goes and sells it uh, on the black market. But, um, there's going to be a lot of shades of grey in the penumbra of this puzzle, uh, which you can engage with and think about. And the very sort of concept of taking something without consent is really multifaceted and really fascinating. Uh, so that is what they will want you to try and get your teeth into. Okay, creativity. Now, of the interviewees that I still remember, it's those that had particularly creative responses. Pretty much everyone I've interviewed has been brilliant. And as I've mentioned, I think on other videos on this channel, 
there was only really one interview that wasn't great and that was because the person decided to abuse me verbally for the whole whole interview <laughs> so the vast majority of interviewees are fantastic uh so when we try and make our admissions decisions it comes down to tiny tiny margins of difference and one of the margins that often stands out is creativity someone who's able to resolve a puzzle in an unusual way now this is not required i should note but if you want to try and stand out the capacity to think somewhat outside the box is a mechanism a route by which you can stand out not required but it is certainly a successful one of course the risk is that if you are thinking outside the box if you are countering intuition you may have a harder time defending yourself so you need to be careful because we will try and stress test your claims we'll come back at you with some awkward questions that might uh, defeat what you're trying to say but if you think you can show off your thinking skills better by not just regurgitating received wisdom but saying something a little bit quirky a little bit original great it can be a very effective way of standing out okay so i've got a few examples here uh, and i'll tell you what i mean so should prisoners have the vote now in the uk at least the intuition in response to this question would be to say no because they currently don't have the vote so many people have been somewhat inculcated in that sense that prisoners should be denied the vote because that's simply the this current situation so prisoners are not able to vote in the uk and so it may be that the the gut reaction is that people say no okay <laughs> but this is an example of where people are perhaps not allowing themselves to engage their thought processes enough they've not slowed the pace of their thinking they're just answering in an impulsive manner and therefore their answers are derivative of someone else's thoughts a teacher uh, a parent uh, you know a newspaper it's not an original thought it's a derivative thought and that's potentially troubling because of course we're trying to admit people who can think for themselves who are independent minded now that's not to say that you can't argue that you know prisoners should not have the vote but if you do argue that you we still want to get a sense of why you think that's the case not why the newspapers think that that's, that's the case or your parents think that's the case okay so as i mentioned in the previous slide one trick is to just imagine you are a defense barrister or defense attorneys you might say in america uh, and you have to work backwards from the conclusion so you have decided that your conclusion is that you're going to defend the proposition that sh prisoners should have the vote and now you're going to have to work backwards to try and establish that case and that will take a little bit of a slowed pace of thinking but we're not judging you on how quickly you solve these puzzles we're judging you on how creatively how analytically you and how precisely you do it so you know if you take a breath and think for a sort of uh five ten seconds to try and come up with a more interesting response then that would be terrific now obviously that can develop as the interview goes through so you don't need to get it straight off the bat but at the same time if you're beginning to offer something a little bit different then that goes down a storm typically so should prisoners have the boat well you could argue yes for a number of reasons they should have the vote because they are still technically citizens and it's a civil right in most uh in most democracies that citizens can have some sort of capacity to determine uh, the political process um, you could say that these citizens of all citizens have been particularly affected by uh, the law <laughs> that they have been subject to and therefore they should perhaps have even more of a right to vote you know maybe you want to say something really outrageous and creative and say something not only should prisoners have the right to vote but they should have two votes for every one that everyone else has why not <laughs> i mean i'm not saying i believe that but this is my point right you don't have to believe it you just need to show your capacity to think through puzzles effectively i think a lot of people get hung up on oh, what do i think about this what what's my what's my belief it doesn't matter uh, what matters is your analytical skills your problem solving skills your capacity to argue um actually frankly sometimes people are better off not believing in what they're arguing because they can come up with a much more sort of rigorous defense. Whereas if they're sort of desperately trying to be authentic, then it can be more difficult to try and work out precisely why they've got that gut reaction. And they're sort of constantly trying to interrogate their own psychology, but that can be quite difficult. Okay, another example, should the use of mobile phones be banned on public transport? Right, so the intuitive impulsive gut reaction is, of course not, <laughs> right? You know, imagine not being able to use your mobile phone on public transport. Imagine the consequences of that. You can't even, you know, check your, uh, you can't check Facebook. You couldn't call for the emergency services if someone's having a heart attack on public transport, right? So the, the notion of banning public uh, uh, mobile phone use on public transport seems uh, to be an extraordinary deprivation of liberty with very sort of little obvious payoff. You know, why would, why would the state 
uh, assuming this is the state that bans um, mobile phones, why would they benefit? Who wins from this policy uh, is, a, is an important question. Qui bono uh, is the sort of Latin phrase that pompous idiots like me occasionally <laughs> use, which means who wins, right? It's a very important question in political science and in law, you know, to try and work out, well, why are you doing this? <laughs> What's the point? Anyway, a creative thinker would be able to say, oh, absolutely, you should ban the use of mobile phones on public transport. <laughs> uh, okay, so now this is really going to stretch your thinking skills. So can you come up with a defense for that? Imagine you've been handed the brief and uh, your barrister's clerk says, you're going to have to go into court and say that mobile phones should be banned on public transport. How would you do it? Right, this is really going to stretch your thinking skills. This is proper show-off territory. This is like someone who can do you know, special tricks uh, in, in a talent show. They they are not just doing what everyone else can do, they're doing something far beyond because it's so much more difficult and hence it's going to stand out. So, I mean, let's have a think, you know, how could we create a defence that mobile phones should be banned on public transport? Well, I mean, of course you can start with the, the sort of the environmental pollution of them, that they are impositions on other people's liberty to enjoy their, their riding in, in uh, comfort. Uh, by its very nature, a public transport is a public sphere, it's a part of sort of a public environment. Uh, and if individuals are engaged in very sort of loud private conversations uh, or various other sort of aspects of a private nature, then that sort of militates against the public, na uh, public um, nature of the venue. So you could say that there's a sort of jarring between the public and the private that ought to be tilted in favour of the public by banning mobile phones. Anyway, I'm sure you can come up with better solutions than that. But the point is that if you want to stand out, be creative. Don't just think impulsively. Don't just think with the crowd. Maybe trot down a few paths less travelled. Okay, should anyone be able to serve on a jury? Now again, the impulsive answer to this would be no, <laughs> because that's the current situation, right? There are restrictions on who can serve on a jury, and some of them would seem to be incredibly sensible, right? By anyone, remember our precise use of language, anyone would mean, you know, anyone. We could talk about, you know, would a would my nine-month-old uh, baby son, Jasper, be allowed to sit on the jury? <laughs> would someone who is, uh, you know, um, in, a, in a permanent vegetative state, who, would they be allowed to serve on a jury? You know, you can take it to almost sort of ludicrous extremes. If you say anyone can serve on a jury, then that literally means anyone. So, <laughs> you know, I suppose we could sort of cur curtail some of the ludicrous elements of the question. But nonetheless, the impulsive response is to say, Nah, nah, you should, you should not allow anyone to serve on a jury. But of course, maybe we want to show off our thinking skills and maybe we could come up with uh, a better defense than that. Maybe we could come up with something a bit more interesting. So we take pace, we sort of slow things down a little bit. We sort of think, hmm, how can I come up with something interesting? What sort of precise use of language have we got here? You know, what does it mean to serve on a jury? Well, of course, that means you're, you're determining the facts of a case. You're part of the peer group of the person accused. And so you perhaps need to have some sort of executive decision-making ability. In other words, the ability to make decisions as to what is factual and what is not factual. So there are certain sort of mental requirements of a juror, which is why there are restrictions currently. But maybe you want to sort of uh, argue that this is part of the problem of jury trials, is that it, it emphasizes the ability to resolve factual disputes. But actually, a lot of uh, criminal justice comes down to emotions. And it could be that children and people with various mental disorders are very well attuned at ascertaining uh, emotion and neurological uh, facets that adults are actually acutely bad at ascertaining. And let's say, for example, that it is a child who's being accused of a crime. Maybe that person ought to be tried by other children uh, in the jury. So, you know, come up with something a bit more creative, a bit more interesting, not impulsive, not simply derivative of what everyone else thinks, then you'll be standing out. It'll be hard. And the interviewers will say, hang on a minute, are you telling me that we should have infants on a jury or people who are, you know, completely incapable of making decisions? How is that possibly defensible? Well, you tell me, right? <laughs> we are very open-minded as interviewers. We're very willing to sort of listen to some quite unusual claims. So try us out. But don't be, don't be too tempted to just go along with the herd and just say what everyone else thinks, because that's not going to help you stand out. Okay, uh, so the final uh, part of the acronym of P, so we've done precision, we've done analysis, we've done creativity, and finally we've got energy. Now, 
this is a much more sort of straightforward in some senses. So what I'm talking about here is that we just want you to see you are engaged, you're enthusiastic, you want to resolve these puzzles, you're interested. This isn't really something you can fake, you know, you can't sort of go around going, oh, law, goody, goody, I'm going to sort of get in and sort of pretend to be bouncing around at the sheer excitement of talking about legal problems. But at the same time, you shouldn't downplay it. I think a lot of people assume that interviews at Oxford and other universities are very serious, that so you've got to have a sort of Great place, and you've got to be. Oh, this is all very serious. I'm not going to enjoy myself at all. Well, if someone is taking things terribly, terribly seriously, and they don't seem to be enjoying themselves, that gives me a little bit of a pause that this person might not terribly want to study law. They might be applying for law because it'll look good on their CV and it'll get them a good career, but they don't really. They're not really into law. They don't actually find the academic discussion of law terribly enjoyable. And that's going to really trouble me because, of course, what we're proposing is to offer you three years or maybe four years, depending on the law degree you're doing, of intense discussion of these sorts of puzzles. And if you're not getting into it, then that's quite alarming. OK, so my basic point is don't downplay your emotions. Don't feel you have to hide the fact that you maybe are enjoying this. You know, you're allowed to crack a smile or laugh or whatever. That's completely fine. Um, but you also can't really fake it. So just be yourself, basically. <laughs> um, but another sort of element to this point about energy is that you will sometimes be asked pretty obtuse questions, you know, pedantic. The sort of question that, you know, if someone asked it in a pub with a group of mates, they would think, oh, God, I, just, I can't be bothered, <laughs> right? They might sort of think this is just the most ridiculous thought experiment. I don't want to engage. This is so silly, right? Um, <laughs> so you need to sort of, of course, suspend that degree of hostility to the line of questioning. And I've got three examples which are particularly sort of oh, difficult questions that might be considered inappropriate in certain social settings, shall we say. So the first one is, what effect on the whole of society does someone crashing into a lamppost have? Now, this is a sort of, <laughs> sort of question which is just so wacky that most people would just think, oh, for goodness sake, why, why even ask that? What's that point, right? And, and that sort of hostility to the notion of asking that question is something that you really need to avoid. Because, of course, although this is a, a pretty bizarre, tiny fragment of a puzzle to look at, the, the effect of someone crashing into a lamppost, we're trying to get a bigger sense of how the sort of the macro-social uh, environment is affected by tiny micro social things and so someone crashing into a lamppost will have a social impact and we want you to try and sort of give us some sense of how you might quantify that what quantum of effect might it have okay so try and sort of see what's interesting about these questions and don't be necessarily too hostile and I promise you I've seen it in interviews where people just sort of say what <laughs> you know what is the point of this bizarre question and I guess I've got some sympathy with that you know if I was to ask this question with my friends and family in a social setting they would just think oh shut up <laughs> you know what are you on about so I get it but at the same time it is fair game in an interview to ask obtuse questions so just go with it okay the second example is does law create morality or does morality create law mm. so this is a sort of <laughs> bit of a, a brain tweezer uh, brain squeezer um and it's very difficult to untangle the causal mechanism here right so it's a bit of a chicken and egg question really so did uh, and the possibility of course is that it's it they are mutually reinforcing, but it's not necessarily just the case that one was the unmoved mover, that there was morality and then it was sort of codified into law, but also that once codified, it then impacted on our morality and there was a sort of feedback. Um, and it's very, very complicated to sort of untangle this causal and historical and social and religious process. <laughs> Some people would just think, oh, screw that. <laughs> I just can't be bothered. But of course, you know, that's not going to go down terribly well in an interview. Uh, for a law degree. Um, finally, can you imagine a world without laws? Again, this is sort of, ooh, can you imagine <laughs> the sort of uh, thought experiment that would leave a lot of people, I dare say, a bit cold and just sort of thinking, let's talk about something worth talking about. But, you know, uh, we in Oxford are sort of outrageously geeky, but geek is a good thing because it just means we're very, very interested in minute details and the universe around us. So, 
<laughs> so we're looking for people that would share that degree of enthusiasm. So if someone asks you, can you imagine a world without laws? Uh, you need to sort of give us some sort of sense of your capacity to imagine that, um, some sort of anarchism. Um, and again, you know, go through the other factors of the, of the interview that I've been talking about. Precision. Uh, what does it mean to be without law? So that could mean without some sort of codification of the rules. But it'd be pretty startling to imagine a society or a world without any regulation of any description. You know, even in lawless societies like a family, for example, there are lots of rules and regulations. They're sort of uncodified rules and regulations. So, you know, I, I have a, I have two sons and a wife. Uh, between us, we don't sort of codify the rules of the household. Um, so we have a house without laws, and yet there are lots of rules and regulations. So I guess it gets you into the sort of the nitty gritty of what it means for something to be a law. And hence, we're looking for your precise and uh, capacity to analyze creatively the question and to do so with a degree of energy hence pace precision analysis creativity and energy anyway i hope this has been helpful at the very least tumbling through 12 past interview questions should give you some sense of what may come up um, if you would like to get in touch do please uh, reach out i'm at matthew.williams at jesus.ox.ac.uk happy to help if i can and i wish you all the very best of luck in whatever you're applying to Thanks so much for watching. All the best. Goodbye.